That's fine. Okay, good. Then, um, if you want, um, we can start now. So, what do you okay. think? Uh, just going for the more general stuff first before we go a bit uh, more specific. What do? You, what would you say is the technical part about blockchain? that most non-technical people don't get or that the mainstream doesn't really get? So the technical part of blockchain that media doesn't get is the underlying trust system. So, so blockchain, like most technologies, is a combination of technologies that makes the transaction work, which makes the movement of value work. And that happens today. It happens through banks, it happens through financial institutions, it happens through mortgage companies. But I think what makes blockchain unique is the ability for you to actually move value and without any of the intermediaries. And you need a lot of trust systems to make that work. So the, the, the trust systems, which is a combination of a rather complex piece of technologies behind the scenes like cryptography and consensus and various immutability that lends itself to the trust mechanism, I think is something that's underappreciated by many of the non-technical folks. And that's something which I think I would encourage people to understand because if you're trying to trust a mechanism to move something that you own and something of value, then you should understand what are the underpinnings of that trust system that networks govern with. So that's something which I've, I've been very focused on from day one, and that's like 20, 20, 2012, 2013, is understanding what makes the trust work in a blockchain network. Okay, uh, since we since you touched on the trust system, and uh, this is something that I was planning for after, but let's uh, ask this right away. Uh, what, what would you say to people? Because this is a, com you know, I personally try to read as much from the negative side of things to the people that try to bash the system down. I think uh, it's very easy in this system to get stuck in your own bubble and don't hear about it. So. What would you say to the people that say that blockchain just overcomplicates very simple things, which is a yeah. common complaint? Yeah, that's a common complaint because so oftentimes the lack of understanding leads to some overdevelopment. And you're also people are also right because we have overly used blockchain for things that doesn't need blockchain. There are many use cases that so the thing is that you try to use blockchain to solve every problem in the world and there's a fatigue of set that falls in, uh, especially trying to understand as to how come this technology just surfaces up and is, can solve everything in the world. So a part of that is just because overhype of a lot of type you know, use cases. But on the contrary, I think blockchain is meant to be invisible technology, which means that it'll be similar to you having a mobile app or you having some sort of an, you know, an, an account-based wallet that you're able to keep things of value and you're able to move things around uh, easily and simply not knowing what is behind the system, just like you don't care about when you go to an ATM machine to withdraw your money, you expect your money to be there because you have an account and you have some money in it. Uh, similarly, when you log on to your you know, financial institution portfolios, when you log on to look into uh, the availability of your mortgage, you, you expect things to be there. You don't care how things are working in the background. Right. So similarly, blockchain is meant to be invisible technology. And so it's up to us, the technologists, to simplify it. And I think that's a, that's a burden that many people from large corporations, including the fintech entities, are trying to solve. Okay. Uh, yeah, of course, I see that problem with trying to put blockchain on top of everything, which happened right at the top of the bubble, right? Of the ICO bubble. Everyone was trying to sell a solution with blockchain for problems that didn't need block blockchain. Uh, would you say that the, this, a, a real blockchain solution, an invisible blockchain solution of the type that you, that you mentioned, do, do you say that goes hand in hand? with the crypto economy and with the centralization? Or is it a way that both can sort of merge? No, no, it, it certainly goes hand in hand. So there are a few things, right? One is, uh, to me, crypto economic systems is essential for some of the underlying technical elements of things like continuous availability of transaction systems. And the crypto economic systems also maintain the trust mechanism, which is what I mentioned earlier, which means that if you're truly trying to create a global system like internet, um, which today sort of, so if I, I've written an article on this which compares the internet 
economics, old days economics model to where we are today. We used to pay for email. We used to pay for a lot of things we don't pay for now because it's built into the commercial activity of e-commerce and many of these things that are happening on the internet, right? So if you draw some analogy to that, um, I believe that the crypto economic system that fuel the upkeep and maintenance of the networks is essential. And to me, I, we've categorized that as layer one protocol, which is essential to upkeep and have the systems in place, the transaction systems. And then comes the evolution of layer two, layer three protocols, which is trying to solve things like scalability, things like security, things like identity. And layer four is when we begin to start seeing the true use of uh, some of these underlying layers in creating things like DeFi, uh, decentralized financing applications are going after, you know, self-sovereign identity, which is giving you the notion of identity as a wallet, a healthcare system, for example, right? So layer four is where you begin to see a decoupling of the knowledge of underlying complexity of the network, exactly like many people don't care or know about protocols like, you know, SMTP and, 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 and NTP type protocols, which maintain the timekeeping on the network that maintains the email system of the network. But most people don't care because these are established protocols. Um, and I, I see similar evolution evolving, and we begin to see that now. You, you see that in DeFi, you see that with many of the entities who are trying to solve, you know, some of the critical problems. Um, so that's where I see this going, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, and, okay, in this decentralization spirit, right, where we hope, and this is like very much from the very much libertarian crypto community and blockchain community, uh, we all then get wondering, okay, if everything is decentralized, what is in there for these big companies such yeah. as IBM to, to get from blockchain? Yeah, so I'll, I'll shed light on that because this is the biggest misconceptions of, of our times. So we should discern between decentralization and distribution. So we have decentralized networks and you have distributed networks. Um, the only difference between something becoming decentralized is the governance structure. Who really has the power to do what, right? And how they enforce the rules that the network has set forth, whether these are artificial rules or the rules that come from the underlying economic systems, right? Uh, so in decentralized, truly decentralized networks like Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, you have rules of engagement. You have miners and you have folks who are doing valid you know, validators, whether it's proof of stake networks or proof of work networks. And these rules allow people to play by the rules and sometimes people try to break the rules and it has consequences like things like forking or things like you know, being ousted from the network, which is the intent of the Ethereum 2.0. But then you also have many of the ERC-20 based networks who are not exactly decentralized. They are quasi, or they are distributed networks because many of the governance of the rules are confined to the sort of the, the, the sub network that they're creating on top, of, you know, top of either. So in many cases, I think the decentralization comes to governance uh, and comes to the true element of the, the, the ability to enforce those rules of engagements uh, and this is where you begin to see the clash with the regulatory bodies in some cases of financial institutions. And so we do want to differentiate between decentralization and distribution. Now, to answer the second part of the question, is the entry point of large corporations like the tech companies, this is the Microsoft and Amazon and IBM to the world, and the financial institution. And so tech companies is simple, right? It's less controversial because as a technology provider, we all the entire spectrum of tech companies want to provide the ability, whether it's cloud or providing compute or providing an easy access to the networking and advanced technology that maintains these massive networks that need to be, or machines that need to be running for supporting the network. So we're playing a traditional role, um, except that in a non-traditional space by creating technologies and easy accessible technologies. Things become more interesting when you look at established financial institution players or non-banking financial institution players or non-healthcare non institution or healthcare information institutions where they want to participate to not only grow their business, but they also want to participate because the, 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 the evolution that's happened in decentralized worlds is a potential threat to the business. So that's, that's the dichotomy they have to deal with. And we are questioning, will a bank or financial institution entering the DeFi space, will that muddy the water? 
or will that enrich the space because of the uh, experience and the legacy and the regulatory apparatus that many of these financial institutions have, can they put that to use to fuel the underlying agenda of economic inclusion, global marketplaces, and creating you know, low-cost way of doing financing, which is not the case today. And that debate is something that we should have in the industry to bring it to reality, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, makes good sense. So if we had to sum up like in the more most non-technical way for the m most average person that doesn't really get blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, if we had to tell them, okay, this is why IBM wants to use cryptocurrency, the, I mean, the blockchain, what would you, what would you tell them? <laughs> so the thing is, uh, two things, right? You've got to realize the difference between using technology and an application that runs on technology. Uh, so we do have a IBM blockchain platform and it's very successful, especially for addressing many of the use cases in things like trade logistics, trade finance, food safety. We've done an amazing job in trying to, you know, uh, bring this technology to solve some of the core elements of supply chain industry and so on and so forth. And we continue to work towards entering the financial industry space. Uh, so we are, we are basically using technology to uh, sort of address what we're good at, uh, in which is technology and, and commercialization of te that, that technology, working with the community, which means that our platform is based on open source, open community, which prevents the lock-in that you expect from very large institution only to serve our clients, which is large banks, large shipping companies, large healthcare companies. Uh, so that's that's our interest in technology because any technology that comes across as a tech company, we should, not just us, but our peers and cohorts are interested in. I think where this becomes really interesting is the application of it. So if there are new fintechs or health techs or rec techs companies, uh, whether they work with a large tech company or are using at some form of fashion, whether using Google, Azure, or IBM Cloud, you're still working with a large tech company some way or some form, including if you go to the tier one cloud providers like Equinix. So at some, at some level, nobody is keeping servers in the back, you know, in, the, in, 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 their, in their basement. And so from that perspective, you are working with a tech company, but I think things become really interesting when you see the application and uh, the fintechs, the rectechs, and the challenger uh, communities is something that is trying to change the world. And that is, to me, uh, more interesting because that's changing the way we do business as opposed to trying to bring efficiency to the computing platform, which is our goal, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah. So, okay, let's move on to the next uh, part. Uh, I see that you, in the same uh, at the same time that you're developing, uh, well, <laughs> this space is always growing, right? There's always something new, and there's always a new big exciting thing, at least uh, a new big uh, exciting selling point. So, and over time, you manage to see which ones actually pass the barrier of being relevant over time, right? So. Digital assets, for example, is something that's been on everyone's mind for a while, and it seems like it's really crystallizing inside of like big companies. What can you tell us about the future that you see with these kind of assets? No, so I, I've spent literally four years on this topic now, and, and we begin to call it now the, the three sort of... So if you learn physics and, and electrical engineering back in the day, you have these rules which has three fingers, and they point different directions of where things are. Similarly, we begin to equate uh, sort of three pillars that we need to address for digital assets. And some of them are BLT, as in business, legal, and technology, right? Because digital assets um, implies there's something of value. And when there's something of value, there may be things like collusion or fraud and fraudulent practices and how do we prevent that, which is safeguarding the digital asset. And so what I have come on, and I will soon publish something on this topic on, is something what we call as three eyes. Three eyes is infrastructure, which is basically the rails, just like what you see as blockchain networks, and the ability to safe keep and custody of the digital assets becomes the infrastructure. And then we call what we call instrument. Instrument is the digital asset itself. And you use the word instrument because uh, you have things like digital securities or digital mortgages, digital payments, central bank digital currencies. These are all different types and we call them instruments. And we have to ensure that each instrument has a legal framework around it because we do live in a world that has governance and that has regulatory elements. And so while we're trying to digitize the space, we have to 
regard and adhere to some of the regulatory elements that are in the market uh, that we need to comply with. And then the third is intelligence, right? Intelligences or insights, which basically is going about understanding the real time fraud analytics, uh, looking into movement of assets and understanding the forecasting of a network, which is all the things that we need to build in from an intelligence perspective for the network. So three eyes in my way, in my opinion, covers the entire gamut of the digital asset space. And in many cases, it's the future because of, of course, we live in this world where everything is forced to go digital, some good, some bad. And in many cases, uh, we begin to see the massive demand and uptake of digital way of doing business. And so from that perspective, uh, I think it's only the future to see that. And I think industry has been moving. If you look at our mortgages and and uh, the materials and, and commodities, that all are dematerialized. You know, when you're trading commodities, you're not actually trading, you know, bricks of gold or, or, or tons of oil and, and barrels of oil and tons of bauxite, for example, you're dematerializing these assets and, and de dealing with the commercial paper. So in many ways, you have decoupled the actual physical asset by creating a commercial paper. We are in the process of digitizing it. And when you're digitizing it, you need to have the three eyes to make it work. Okay, this brings to mind uh, well, so, so many examples, of, um, especially with the financial markets, which are the the main way where we see this, right? And um, you mentioned that this uh, force, this that digitalization has happened in both good and bad ways. Uh, can you tell us some more about the bad ways that you see that things are being forced to digitalize? Good ways is in general that there's a lot of reduction of friction, and I've done a lot of experiments in trying to open business accounts and trying to open bank accounts and uh, online. And I have, you know, ESITs of Estonia try to as a part of experimentation, do the work with identity frameworks. And fairly easy, I want to leave the house, I can open an account in the house, I can quickly have banking information, which gives me access and tools that every small business, every individual needs to participate in the global economy. So these are all good things, right? We can, I don't have to go spend an hour going to a bank, uh, trying to open different accounts and show my ID. I mean, I, there's a mechanism now where there's enough technologies to validate and verify who you are from uh, various elements that you could do. So all these are good things and bad things that, of course, and that happens even in existing financial world, uh, fraud is misuse of that information, right? Misuse and, and misuse of that whole element. That a uh, few bad apples trying to exploit the system that leads to more stringent regulation, more, you know, elements of, 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 uh, of that stuff. And that still happens today. I mean, there are a lot of nefarious activities happening on, on many of the decentralized networks. And uh, you begin to see emergence of chain and analysis like companies trying to analyze the fraud potential on some of these networks. Uh, so that's to me is the, uh, the one downside of some of these things that these are used for the face and it gives them a bad name. Not to mention the fraud doesn't happen in the existing system. It happens even in the, in the system that we live in. Uh, second thing I think is that uh, the lack of, because this is growing so fast and the regulations need to be educated and understood, uh, the lack of regulation, lack of clarity in regulation is creating a lot of confusion. And when you have confusion and obesity of information, that leads to a lot of people exploiting that situation, uh, whether it's the, you know, the entities who are trying to uh, exploit the situation by providing, uh, you know, opinionated advice and charging massive fees for it, or trying to exploit the system by making something legal that it's not, which then affects the entire community in general. So those are the few things that I would think that is working against the force. But uh, like I say, you know, like, you know, Uber is a perfect example of Uber, which was born in California. Uh, I used to always give an example of not going back. And uh, with the legislation now, Uber is pulling out of the state which it was born, which is California, which to me is a sad thing because in some cases it's, it's going back to the old way of doing business, which uh, is not, you know, not the right direction in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, the, it's sad as well because you see that regul regulations or these legislations are kind of driving uh, innovation away from the place that it's born, right? Uh, and in that respect, would you what, what would you think are the biggest regulatory risks when we talk about uh, the whole this whole ecosystem that is just being born, uh, maybe? 
maybe deranging because some strange regulation that comes out of nowhere. What do you think is a risk for in this respect? Well, um, so I, 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 you know, we wrote a piece on this earlier when, you know, so main thing with regulatory risk with my, today with most regulatory risk is the viability of doing business. So as a business, um, as a fintech, uh, you decide to go into raise funds and go into a space that's unique and highly regulated. Right. Well, the regulatory risk is that you're investing a year and let's say $20 million and you could be shut down because the regulation can shut you down. Just like an Uber example, right? That one market is, is shut down because of one, one signature goes and, and you have to pull out the market. So for FinTech, especially going into, into this heavily regulated markets, especially in financial services or healthcare services, becomes an interesting challenge for businesses because of investment and, and the risk that goes with it. But then there's also the other side of the argument of risk and reward, that you don't take the risk, you don't get the reward of, of it because you're entering a space and if regulation works in your favor, then you have the first market advantage of being in that space. As an investor, you have similar challenges, right, that uh, a regulation may, uh, so you need regulation because you need to protect your asset because regulation is really, really there to protect me and you. Uh, and of course, it has a downside of, providing the burden of proof and all these things, which is uh, the side effect, the causal effect of a more tighter regulatory sort of apparatus that needs to be maintained. But as an investor, you could lose capital from the, on, the, on the downside that you take advantage of the early investor mindset if you be in there. So there's a risk and reward to everything that we do. And I think that's, the, that, that's something which we have to weigh in, especially going into the newer business models that are emerging uh, because the fraud's happening it's quite rampant, and that's true for anything that's new, from gold rush to internet rush and to crypto rush, similar similar landscapes that we see. Okay, uh, for the for the average person, I mean, it's uh, pretty obvious to me that these regulations also inform their opinions, right? So, in the end, if the governments end up saying that you should not do something. Uh, even if you're on the other side of things, you end up believing that you shouldn't, right? Because that's just the way that you assign authority to their opinion. Um, for what else do you think uh, could happen outside the the main blockchain environment to really shine light into this uh, into this technology and its potential? What other external factors do you think need to combine to make this? Uh, either grow faster or consolidate it as a reality? So I think in many cases, every time we've had a crisis around the world, you begin to see some of these technologies shine, right? We've had, we've had pandemics, we've had national calamities, we've had a uh, sort of social eruption of inequality in many countries that led to political instabilities. And every time that has surfaced, we've relied upon things that the apparatus as chastised as a vehicle, right? And I think Bitcoin becomes an interesting conversation from that perspective. But I'm suggesting that, that in no means I'm suggesting that you know, regulations are important and we should educate the regulators and work with them because it's really there to protect the consumers. I want to make that very clear because oftentimes regulation is charged with, and I'm not saying this because I have a, a regulated industry point of view, but I have worked with many regulators, but if you, if you read the rules of regulation and the charter of regulation, it's really meant to protect the common person by ensuring that there are liabilities by various people who are in the, doing that business. So for even for like, for example, crypto, for crypto custody, it's a serious business. And you've seen many hacks and many uh, vulnerabilities in the system, which has caused a lot of issues with people losing a lot of money. And so if it's for common men, you need to have the appropriate regulation to ensure that people are accountable. And if they're making money from it, they're also uh, factoring in for the risk of the technology risk and regulatory risk, which protects me and you if we are the investors or if we are asking them to see, safeguard our assets. Because I don't think you know every common person can be uh, trusted with keeping up with the crypto way of doing things because it's a very complicated, you know, at least today, it's not yet consumer friendly. So it's really meant to protect us. So I think but every time we see this, so I think it's better that we get ahead of it and create a system that is not only compliant to regulation, but creates uh, ease of use 
of creating corridors. For example, you begin to see now the Monetary Authority of Singapore having a corridor with FCA in England. That's a corridor that's a, that's a fintech-friendly corridor, for example. Uh, similarly, you've seen Bank of Japan having a similar corridor with, with, uh, with the Bank of England. So these corridors should be the first test to say, this is cross-border movement. We've built this and it's proven its technology. At that point, you are actually accelerating the effort of creating simple, similar corridors around the world, which will help us distill this down to a single financial network. Uh, so I think that's what we can do from outside is, is promote the use and, and build the communities to understand it. At the same time, educate the global regulators that it is also being competitive from a global standpoint, which is why you see many of the smaller agencies really focusing on crypto because they view it as a competitive uh, advantage that they can get on, which today is only limited to the, uh, you know, to the, the, the West, which is the, the United States and the North American continent and the, uh, the European continent. Now it's moving rapidly in Asia with China leading many of the other entities. So it's viewed as a, having that infrastructure is viewed as a, as a global competitive advantage. And that will fuel innovation around the world. And that's the only answer, I think, is knowledge and technology applying meaningfully is the only, only way to do it. And of course, yeah, 100% agree with everything you said, and particularly with what you said before that these uh, sort of crises, these uh, these big problems worldwide, really shine light upon the importance of new technologies and their applications. And you can see it very clearly with the pandemic causing disastrous results in the global markets and decentralized finance, on the other hand, booming like it never had before. Uh, what other fragile systems would you say that we can fix through blockchain technology or we can make stronger through blockchain technology? Well, you have to clarify this statement because most systems are fragile in some sense, right? You see constant technical problems of system outages that we see around the world, the cybersecurity risks that we see around the world the vulnerabilities that we see around the world has a global impact. And you don't expect a government body to step in to help every time that happens, right, from the from perspective. So to me, one thing, did decentralization, again, uh, decentralization in terms of governance and control, at the end of the day, decentralized systems are distributed systems, is it gives you that ability to not have a honeypot of, like, for example, the reason why cybersecurity threats are becoming so successful because they're able to attack one spot which have all the information about individuals or have access to all the accounts and do nefarious activities and 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 and, and enter that, those systems. Uh, I think in many cases the decentralization provides a level of addresses the fragility as you as you put it by providing a more resilient infrastructure of technology but also more resilient governance framework to ensure that the governing bodies which is stakeholders in proof of stake, for example, or miners in case of proof of work, or depending on whatever trust technology you end up choosing, have a certain level of accountability in preserving the governance structure of the network, and they have to have a coordinated effort. So if you take that structure of what we see today in the decentralized world and apply that to a more, I would call a permission network, which is not exactly open to all, but open by let's say all the banks, all the financial institutions who are maintaining this network, I think it forces them to stay coordinated while maintaining the, the jurisdictional independence. And that is the model I think would, would help uh, address the fragility, not just from a availability perspective, but also from dealing with the up and coming cybersecurity challenges that we see on a daily basis. That's a great answer. And I think that's a great way to start wrapping up. Just uh, as we start finishing off this interview, uh, a fun question. Any controversial opinions or any things that you think that go against the mainstream on this uh, ecosystem? I mean, look, uh, I don't want to just create controversy for the sake of controversies. I just think that the regulated financial institutions and regulated entities should view blockchain as something that is their for good and is there to change the world. So I, I, and that's why all my writings and all the work is more focused towards understanding it than fighting it. Uh, so I would say that, that we should try to understand because there is a massive potential and 
there's a lot of good that the industries can do. Um, yes, there's there's a downside of this whole thing where you lose a revenue opportunity, which exists today. But that's the whole thing about creating new business model is you lose a revenue opportunity today, but you create new revenue opportunities by going towards a newer platform and newer ways to do business. And that's where I would, I would, I would, you know, not controversial, but I think that's something which would be my ask. Yeah, no, 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 controversial. You touched the question pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Okay. So anything else you'd like to add for our, for our readers? Especially no. considering that it's uh, mostly going to be sent to institutions and this kind of... Uh... No, keep up the good work. And uh, you have, a, as a research entity that you're trying to evaluate information, you also have a you also have a lot of responsibility on your shoulders to make sure that you're communicating the right things and, and stuff. So so good work with that, and uh, I wish you luck. Well, thank you very much, Nitin. It's been really enlightening this chat. Likewise. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be sending you the article when it's finished. Okay, no worries. Have a good one. Stay safe. Thank you very much. You too. Bye bye.